Professor Anwar Badani uh, is an internationally recognized oncological radiologist at Mount Vernon Cancer Center, London, UK. He's a professor of cancer imaging at the Institute of Cancer Research, London, a trustee of the International Cancer Imaging Society and co-chair of the International Prostate Pirates Committee. He has so many publications and he has a very high age index of 76 and uh, we're going to listen to his nice talk. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank uh, Wafa for the uh, kind invitation to, uh, to present to you today. These are my disclosures. So Yeli has just outlined the major issues with performing high quality MRI and some of these are outlined here. You can see that too many men need an examination, there are too many false positives and too many indeterminate or PIRADS 3 cases. Now it turns out that artificial intelligence will be able to address a number of these processes that, Im that impede the, um, the rollout of prostate MRI. But today I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, analysis of the images, which is the focus of this talk. Now, any AI system needs to perform five basic um, functions. And the first function is the outlining of the gland and the zones within the gland. Once that is done, the AI system needs to detect and localize lesions, not cancers, but lesions, so potential candidates. The next thing that needs to happen is a classification. The classification is a, is a level of suspicion, and the level of suspicion is what Yeli referred to in the last talk by a level of suspicion the 1 to 100 scale. Finally, it must remove. It must remove all the false positives. And lastly, the contouring and the mapping needs to go into a biopsy system so that a urologist can use the AI for planning a biopsy. So there are basically five steps which I have illustrated on the right-hand side. Now, if you look at an AI today, and there are some manufacturers on the right, and you'll see some of these manufacturers in the stands, what you have to realize is that there are two types of software. There's a type of software that is an assistant. An assistant enables a radiologist to perform their diagnostic work accurately and consistently. But there is another type of software, which is a more sophisticated software, which actually contributes to biopsy decisions for detection uh, high-grade cancers. So you can, you can see that one is for the radiologist and one is a urological management tool. So an assistant has to show evidence of improved radiological working. In other words, accurate detection, improved reading consistency, and time savings. That's what you have to remember. And this is the evidence that you need to look for. So here's a, an AI that I sometimes use, and you can see the arrow on the T2 image with the color image shows you the AI showing you a very subtle PIRADS4 lesion anteriorly in the transition zone. This is very typical. Now this, this software is an assistant because what it does is it pre-processes the images even before you see them. So on the right-hand side, you can see the AI is identifying three lesions, and for each lesion, it's giving a PIRAD score. Can you see that on the right-hand side? You can see that um, here. I don't know if you can see my arrows. Can you see my Yeah, there. So you can see the, the scores are given here. Now, if you look at, at an AI, how much does it help if you are an expert. Now, this is very nicely shown here. You can see that the AI helps by about 4%. So if you're a radiologist who is an expert, 
the AI will improve your calls of pirates four and five lesions by about four to five percent. Not much. But the interesting thing is the consistency improves dramatically. And if you look here, you'll see that the consistency improves significantly. In other words, the problem that, that um, Yelly was describing, where there's a great deal of variation between radiologists, reduces by half. And that is an assistant function of the AI. I just wanted to show you a case. Now, here's a man with a small lesion. You can see the arrow, a Pyrads 4 lesion. Now, the radiologist report is shown on the right-hand side. You see, the radiologist says there's a, there's a, there's a radiologist says there's a Pyrads 4 lesion at the right base, and the radiologist also says that there is a polyp in the rectum. Okay, and so there's the lesion that you can all see, and the polyp is shown here. You can see in the orange arrow on the sagittal image. Now you see the radiologist has now developed what's called satisfaction of search. He has seen one small lesion, he's seen a rectal polyp, but he has missed the Pyrads 5 lesion at the apex. And the Pyrads 5 lesion is in, is in fact a is is in, in fact Pyrads uh, 4, not 5, because it is not hyperintense on the high B value image, but you can see it enhances briskly. So this is in fact a Pyrads 4 lesion. Now, if you did an AI, you can see the AI sees the lesion at the right base. Here you can see it here. Yeah, it clearly identifies that lesion, but look, the AI also identifies the lesion at the apex on the left. You see that? Clearly identifies it. And you see, this wasn't noticed by the radiologist. And look what happened. The patient had a incomplete resection at the left prostatic apex. So you see how the AI could have assisted the radiologist get the right lesions, and that would have been valuable for the surgeon. Instead, this patient had an R1 resection and needed post-operative salvage therapy. Now, when you look at a number of patients, what you notice is that the number of, of, of um, negative cases when you use an AI increases. So you'll see, if you're an experienced radiologist here, without uh, AI and with an AI, the number of negative calls increases. So you'll say, this is not important. But look what happens to the number of positive cases. You'll see the number of positive cases goes down, right? So a radiologist becomes much more definite about how he reads the cases. But look at the number of Pyrads 3 cases the number of Pyrads 3 cases doesn't change. Although, you'll see the AI does not call many Pyrads 3 cases. So in other words, at the moment, the radiologists are not trusting the AI system. They are trusting it on the positive side, they are trusting on the negative side, but they are not trusting in the middle, Okay, which is a very interesting um, observation. Now, the important thing is not the radiologist, but the urologist. How does a urologist use this information? In other words, if the urologist uses an AI, is there an improvement in the detection of clinically significant disease? This is the, this is the, the, the important question. In other words, if he uses an AI like this, which has an integrated biopsy tool, within it, will, the, will you find more cancers? And this is the important thing. Now, this is a very nice paper that was published recently. And what it shows is, at the patient level, which is the middle graph here, if the AI shows a lesion, you get more patients with clinically significant disease. 
if you have an AI that shows more lesions, there is also an improvement in the detection of clinically significant cancers. So in other words, what we are saying is there is a translation of a depiction in a patient or a lesion into an improved detection of clinically significant disease. But look, the AI still misses cancers. Look, this one cancer was missed, and these six lesions were also missed. So AI is also missing lesions, right? AI is not 100%. So who does the AI help? The AI helps both inexperienced and experienced radiologists. Here you'll see an experienced radiologist on the top on the right. You can see this is AI. This is the radiologist without the AI, and his performance increases. But look, look down here. If you look at the bottom right-hand side here, look, there is an inexperienced radiologist. So maybe some of you, right? may be inexperienced at a, a using uh, prostate MRI. Look what happens if you use the AI. The performance improves dramatically. So an AI can make an inexperienced radiologist an experienced radiologist just by pressing a button, right? Just by pressing a button. And interestingly, if you look at the AUC value, this is 0 0.8 and this is 0 0.81 an, uh, an experienced radiologist without an AI. So the AI improves you, makes you from an inexperienced radiologist to an experienced radiologist. The AUC is almost the same. It's a very interesting result. Now, how does an AI compare to Yelly Berens, right? It turns out the AI is performing less well than Yelly Berens. So if you look here, this is the study that Yelly showed you. This is Yelly's performance. So at 90% sensitivity, you can see his false positive rate is here, which is about 30%. This is the AI's performance here, yeah? So it's less good. So it won't make you an expert. It'll make you experienced, right? And if, this is important. So an AI will make you experienced, but won't make you an expert today. This is 2022, 2023. So the question is, will AI is it ready for you to use today? Now, the first thing you have to remember, and, and remember this, be very careful. If you take an AI developed in Europe and you use it in Egypt, will it perform the same? And the answer is no, right? And this is shown very nicely here. So if you take an AI with a semen system in one hospital, and you use it, you develop it in one group of patients and the same patients in the same hospital, the AI is the same. But you move to a different hospital in Germany in this particular, in this case, with the same MRI system. You can see the performance is less. So you take an AI developed in Heidelberg for the Heidelberg population and you move it to Essen, which is about 100 miles away. It performs less well, even with the same machine. So don't think that you will get the same performance that it was originally developed for. You must be careful, because your population will be different to the, this population. So you be very, very careful, number one. Number two. The AI is often a black box, and you have to be careful about black boxes. So the, in the European Union, there is a, something uh, in the new regulations, there is something about the AI must explain why it says something. And here's an example. So here is an obvious Pirates 4 lesion. Yeah? Everybody can see this Pirates 4 lesion. Even the medical students at the back there can see this Pirates 4 lesion. But the AI says negative, right? 
This, in fact, is a cancer. Why? The AI doesn't give you an explanation. It just says negative. So if you believe it, then you are going to miss cancers. It doesn't give you an explanation why it misses. So the new AIs are being developed that give you this explanation. And it's important to ask the question before you put money and buy a system. Will it tell me why it got it right? Will it tell me why I got it wrong? Yeah, you must ask that question. Now, what's going to happen to AI next and then next? The new versions of AI are already being developed. And the, these versions of AI are already taking into account PSA density. You'll remember that Yelly said that it's important to take PSA density into consideration. The new AIs are already doing it. So ask the question before you pay. What is the next step? The next, the next question is, will your AI output help the urologist do a biopsy? Will it help your MDT? Or do you have to sit and still do the drawing? If you still have to do the drawing, then actually it doesn't help you as much as you realize. Now, the new versions of AI are now becoming integrated into tools like this. So this is a MDT tool, multidisciplinary team tool, where the AI input goes straight into an MDT tool. So you can see how the next step and the next step are now being planned for the future. So key questions before you pay for you, before you pay, right? Key questions. What do you want the AI for? Is it to help you or is it to help the urologist? Remember, the questions are different, the requirements will be different. Will it work with your data? Will it work with your workflow? And has it got the functions that you need in your clinic? And what is the certification? Right? Ask about certification. Okay, so these are my uh, final take home points. Now, the current level of software 2023 delivers a, a more consistent level of performance like an average trained radiologist but remember it gets false positives and it gets false negatives just like an experienced radiologist it is not a specialist piece of software yeah so what we can say is at the moment the role is to improve the consistency and the accuracy of MRI reporting right integration into multidisciplinary teams has not yet occurred but will be the next step finally you must remember and don't forget there is no level one evidence no level one evidence on multiple readers with multiple platforms against a strong histological standard so although you can buy the software it doesn't mean you should buy the software because at the moment it is functioning as a assistant not as a as a management tool thank you very much leave uh, it's better that maybe we, we we take some questions now for the first two talks and then and then we continue okay uh, are there any questions from the floor? I already have some questions, so uh, but I'm check with the floor first. So, uh, hello, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Parents, Dr. Badini, for uh, their excellent uh, presentations and uh, uh, new concepts for screening and the AI. And my first question, Dr. Parents, about the screening program. And uh, in Egypt, we have an issue here. Uh, most of the MRI machine is 1.5. So uh, I think you agree with me, the best is for 3T Tesla for screening. 
So what's your recommendation regarding a screening program well done mostly by 1.5 T's? So do you suggest a specific uh, protocols or uh, aiding contrast injection, for example, or what's your recommendation regarding this issue? Okay, the screening program. Um, 1.5 Tesla can be good, but you need to have steep gradients. That means that the switching of gradients of your machine should be adequate. Uh, because if you don't have it, especially the diffusion weighted images will suffer, and then you will have problems in recognizing tumors in the peripheral zone uh, and separating them from non-tumor tissues. So the number of false positives may increase. So for screening, that is not optimal um, however you can use them provided that the image quality is good so my advice would be um, that if you start a, pro an, a screening program that you have a committee a group of people where the where there is quality assessment so you should have a leading team of three technicians one who knows for Siemens the other for GE and the other one for Philips, they work together and they are using the PICOR criteria for the quality evaluation. So every site, and I, l I know that there are nine sites with the test screening program here in e Egypt, every site should have that evaluation for every image so that you know the image quality. If the quality is not optimal, and that can happen with a 1.5 Tesla machine, perhaps a little bit more frequent than with three Tesla, but that needs to be addressed. The group of the expert technicians need to help their colleagues at Alexandria or wherever. That's one. In that group also there needs to be a few expert radiologists who are together with the technicians leading that team. The radiologist will take care about the variability of the interpretation of the radiologist. Because what you need to have is a consistent image quality, which is good, and a consistent quality of the interpretation. In the future, but in the future, and that's still in the test phase, that may be helped with artificial intelligence. So my advice would be to form a committee which is looking at quality of acquisition and interpretation. It's just the way we were dealing with mammography about 20 years ago. In our country, we have a committee which is formed by the government, paid by the government, with technicians, a radiologist, and even a pathologist. So that would be my advice here in Egypt. And I'm very happy to hear that you already started. Second, and then I'm done with my answer, you need to carefully evaluate the data that will come out of your test trial of the nine sites before you expand it to other sites. See where you missed things, where you can have learned things before you repeat a mistake in other centers. So do it step by step. That's the right way. I hope that answers the question. Yes, uh, okay, thank you. But regarding uh, maybe uh, this question for uh, Dr. Uh, Badini and, uh, and you, of course, regarding AI is, uh, all the software which uh, done and uh, you mentioned in your uh, presentation is rely only in three Tesla or can we use it for enhancements of the power of 1.5T? Is this is uh, done before or there is a comparative studies regarding these issues between two power of the machine? Yeah, I mean, I, I basically agree with what Yeli said. I mean, 3T is ideal, but you do not need to use it because all, all the pictures that I showed you were 1.5. Oh, yeah. But it has to be a modern 1.5 with, as Yeli said, high spatial gradients. So you need high gradients, and you should make sure that you now use the AI for the reconstruction. And when you use AI, and Yeli mentioned this earlier in his talk, you can use uh, AI acceleration, and we do that all the time, to either improve SNR or improve signal to noise ratio or decrease time. So AI that the manufacturers are now offering will enable you to do all of these things. 
So you yeah. can boost your signal using AI techniques. Yes, definitely. Okay, thank you. And the Trasar wants to ask you something. Hello, Dr. Padan. Um, so my question regarding your um, session that you were just saying that AI, uh, when you use it for the same uh, machine for yeah. learning within the same country, yeah. it does not give the exact same results if it's like shifted to another uh, city within the country for the population regarding things. What should I rely on when learning or training the AI? Or what would be the benefit if I purchase this system yeah. and use it, for instance, in Egypt, and it was trained in Germany? Exactly. So what's the benchmark? OK, so what you need to do is, first of all, you need to make sure that the prevalence of disease in your circumstance is the prevalence or matches the prevalence of disease uh, in um, where it was trained. Now, all the AIs at the moment uh, in Europe are trained on white people. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, like for example, the Siemens AI, it's trained on Northern Europeans. Now, e Egyptian men are not Northern Europeans, right? Egyptian men may be more similar to uh, American men because of the uh, Afro-American heritage mm. that, that they have there. And in fact, in London, as it turns out, that we don't tend to use the Rotterdam risk calculator because we have a great number of Asians mm. and black people that live mm. in London. So and it's about 18%. Mm. So we tend to use the North American calculators, which are a better representation. So it may be that you have to use, an, you have to use the AI that's trained in a different population. And you need to know what the prevalence is. Now, so for example, in Egypt, I expect in your screening population, in your first round, you will have a lot of locally advanced prostate cancers. Mm. We hardly see any locally advanced prostate cancer nowadays in, in Europe. So, so in fact, the AI might have a better performance than you realize mm. in the first round. Mm. But in the second round and the third round, you'll see the degradation of the performance. The question is, is the degradation of the performance still within the acceptable range. Mm. Now, remember, the acceptable range is at 90% sensitivity. The false positive rate is 50%. That is the standard. Mm. The Pirates Committee will publish this shortly. Mm. So what we are saying is, at a patient level, at a 90% sensitivity, we expect a false positive rate of 50%. Now, if you are better than 50%, even if there's a degradation in performance, it's still considered acceptable. So these standards will be published next by the Pyrites Committee, and there's a paper on its way. So as long as you're not going to 30% false positives, then it would not be acceptable. So it depends, but you need to monitor and be careful, because it will, uh, what I was showing you is, it will degrade. It will degrade. So basically, I can uh, get the system from yeah. a country yeah. that best matches our profile and then start from there. Exactly. And okay. that will give you the best start. OK. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you, Professor Padani. We got uh, for our lectures again. We're going to continue. And then we return to the, our question. Thank you, sir.